<laughs> Dr. Avonigan on. He has a new book out, The Heart of Caring, A Life in Pediatrics. Dr. Vonnegut, it's a pleasure to have you on. Thanks so much for taking time to come on today. Thank you. All right, so we're going to kick around the book in all things healthcare in general. But tell the viewers as we start a little bit about yourself in general, why you wanted to write this book. I wanted to write this book because I wanted to um, say how much, how, what a wonderful career I've had taking care of kids. Uh, and I also have seen things change from service to money. And I think medical care is supposed to be about helping people. And I see the next generation coming up and they're told what to do and when to do it. And then, and very few uh, doctors coming up uh, have the kind of choices I've had. Thank you for doing that. So what made you want to get in the medical field in general? It's a, such a tough field with, like you said, there's so much money involved in it now. Obviously, there's malpractice issues. <laughs> there's all kinds of stuff. So what made you want to go into this crazy, but, you know, rewarding field? Yeah, it didn't used to be uh, so much about money. When I started, I was, uh, my visits were 10, 15, and $20 overhead per uh, cost with $3 a visit. So when it was the right thing to do, we could and did give away care. Um, I was a hippie. I was a very good hippie. Um, and uh, we all thought the world was going to end. And I think a lot of our teachers and parents thought the world was going to end. So uh, myself and a few friends headed out to British Columbia and to set up, uh, you know, a self-sufficient farm. We built buildings. We started, uh, we did a good job. But then when the world didn't end and I was asking myself, okay, what do you do now? Or what should you have done? I was pretty good at math and science. And uh, so I said, I should have been a doctor. I was six years older than all the other applicants. And, um, and, I, and I should have been a doctor. And I went to UMass Boston, uh, got lucky and got into medical school. Uh, can you talk about your feelings with the healthcare system? I know you dabbled in a little bit earlier about this, but it seems like the system is really focused on profits. I mean, we just saw Pfizer on the vaccine this past year in 2021, they made $35 billion just on one vaccine, not right. on all the other drugs they've had. Right. So that's just one company in many with the opioid crisis too in, in a full effect still. It seems like the healthcare crisis in this country is really insane. It is insane. And uh, we as a country are paying $4 trillion uh, for uh, second rate health care. Uh, and, you know, when I was a kid and I broke my arm playing football, um, I went to the local hospital and they fixed for 10, 15 bucks. Right. Um, and it, it's, it is because of the insurance companies because um, they can and do make a lot of money. They w don't make money treating HIV. They don't make money treating hepatitis A, B, and C. They don't make money treating autism. It's just not worth it. They make money on blockbuster, <laughs> blockbuster drugs that, and that's all they care about. They don't do research to, you know, to advance research, but um, it is, it, 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 it's incredible because you look at the math and you say, uh, well, any other, any other place in the industrial world could do what we're doing for $2 trillion or less. So that's $2 trillion, not a small amount of money that could be pumped back into science, could be pumped uh, into curing things like autism. Uh, and w that $2 trillion is just being eaten up um, into profits. And we allowed that. We, we back in 19, what, 73 or whatever, uh, we as a country, our Congress, as I like to call it, the best Congress money can buy. Yeah, um, that's but, true. Uh, <laughs> but they said, okay, uh, HMOs and these guys can be run for profit. And so they can and they do. Uh, and 
the the whole thing about Blue Cross Blue Shield and everything is a lot of their money is made by dumping expensive patients into Medicaid. Some of the patients I talked about in the book had complicated systems, which were going to cost Blue Cross a lot of money, who were still taking in $20,000 $20, per family, said, you know, there's a great program that takes care of complicated kids like you. It's called Mass Health. Uh, we're going to counsel you to, and 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 they did. So these complicated, expensive patients were ditched by Blue. In that case, I think it was Harvard Community, but it doesn't matter because mm -hmm. they're all doing the same thing. Um, but anyway, so they got out of paying for this expensive kid and others just by dumping them into Medicaid. So. You know, I've heard a lot about this, and I want you to kind of state the record if you have answers about this. You know, throughout the COVID crisis, and this is even before the COVID crisis, so I'll even talk about that. So most of these hospitals are owned by private equity companies. They're cutting jobs, especially right now, from nurses and doctors. Mm -hmm. So we already have that issue where they cut their hours, they cut them out because they want to make that profit, as, as you stated. Along with that, we have the vaccine mandates and the firing of people, nurses at hospitals in that issue in some states. So it's a two for one there, mm -hmm. where these people are either getting let go because private equity wants to make more money or because they don't want to take the vaccine. You know, it's causing long waits in the hospital. So how do we fix this issue? Because it seems like now private equity due to the COVID crisis had this light bulb that came up out of their brain and they say, listen, we can cut costs mm -hmm. and cut some of these nurses and doctors. Mm -hmm. and, and, you, and if we want to say it's the vaccine mandate, we can do that too and use that as an excuse. And, you know, no one knows who these hospitals are owned by in general. And there's people, I hear it in Rhode Island, that they're waiting five, six, seven, eight hours in emergency rooms. And then I laugh, Doc, because they, you know, we used to hear these things about Medicare for all and socialized medicine and Canadians are coming over here for all these procedures. You know, where is all that talk now? Because I think if that talk was going on now, people would laugh and say, just go to your local emergency room and see how long it takes you to be seen or get uh, illness corrected. Right. And the whole thing, I think, is driven by debt. Uh, unpaid medical bills are the biggest source of debt uh, and bankruptcy, which leads to broken families and homelessness and on and on. Right. So they're in debt. The next piece of debt that drives it is uh, educational debt. Uh, what it costs in most industrial countries to become a doctor, Correct. your educational debt is a, an interesting number. It's zero because they think a well-trained doctor is a good investment because that's going to help. Next, the hospitals are in debt because they've been forced to raise their overhead to meet all the, whether they call it uh, quality improvement programs that don't improve quality. Um, so they, they, they're in debt and so they have to get the money somewhere. Um, and so they have to go along with the hospitals. The hospitals say, oh, your patient can, with a heart attack, they can only stay three days here. And the hospital, if they still wanna still get paid, kick them out after three days. Talk about emergency rooms, uh, a, a ton of emergency rooms, sometimes half of the patients are kids with behavioral disorders. They're big kids, they have autism, um, the they can beat up their mothers, they can't be taken care of at home, they need a psych hospital, and there's nothing available. They stay a week in the emergency room, never seeing a psychiatrist, finally going to a psych hospital and getting overtreated with drugs and sent home. The whole thing is a disaster. We, we could be addressing these problems, but we're not. Right. I just, and people will disagree with this on air, but I'm going to say it anyway. I don't know how we can call ourselves the greatest country in the world anymore 
when we have people on the streets, people don't have health care, veterans mm -hmm. are committing suicide, regular people are committing mm -hmm. suicide. The COVID crisis has been insane over here, whereas other countries have handled it way better than we have. It's just really a disaster. And it doesn't matter, Democrat, Republican, it's on both people's hands. There's blood on Congress people and Senators' hands because of their funding by Big Pharma and how this has killed people in plain English with the opioids crisis and even mm -hmm. in the COVID crisis. So what... Uh... I mean, there shouldn't be such a thing as a homeless vet. You take a young man who was healthy enough to get into the armed services and you turn him into a homeless person with PTSD, drug addiction, whatever. Um, that, that, I don't think there should be such a thing as homelessness anywhere. Um, it's, it's, and that is where we have huge reservoir of untreated HIV, hepatitis A, B, and C, um, untreated tuberculosis, um, you know, the mental illness, the addiction, all of which we could, we could address and we could cure and we could help these people if we chose to. I have a, I have a really simple idea, <laughs> you know, because people say, well, Medicare for all is really complicated and all that. I think it would be a great system. I think any single payer would work. But what if we took this? What if we said, uh, whether it's nurses, doctors, uh, hospitals, whatever. What if we said, um, let's get rid of the things that harm patients. And that would take a lot of the profits out of healthcare. So you do the math and you say, oh, co-payments hurt patients. Get rid of it. Yeah. We did for COVID-19 to make public health better. And now we're going to get it back. And then we say, okay, well, deductibles, guess what? They hurt patients. Then we say prior authorizations, they hurt patients. So you could go through the, we, and we didn't have any of these things 40 years ago. They did not exist. Co-payments mm -hmm. didn't exist. So if you go through healthcare and you get rid of the things that harm patients, the things that at the end of medical school, you take this oath, <laughs> it says don't don't hurt people <laughs> um, then uh, then you could uh, once you drive the profits out you get rid of the people who are making money uh, what I was going to ask you is uh, guess guess what um, the, the CEOs the execs of uh, healthcare co uh, companies make per year they're making about 40 or 50 million probably around there you're yeah. a good guesser <laughs> And, and that's exactly right. And the yeah. pharmaceutical industry, even the ones not that are, you know, that are, are a little less, they're making 20 mil a year. And when they go in front of Congress, they say, we're supposed to be for profit. We're just doing what we have to, to make a profit. And to an extent, they're correct, but that's perverting medicine. It's the money of medicine getting rid of the mission. I'm kind of battling right now in the mindset, Doc, and I don't know if you have any answer for this, but you know, you could free free to say whatever you want to say. That I, when I was young, I took all my vaccines. I never had a problem. I've taken my flu vaccine my whole life and never had a problem. And now this other vaccine, it seems to well, I won't even say it seems it it seems to have given me a problem where this happened two weeks after the vaccine. I've talked to many doctors, doctors from John Hopkins, from doctors to Baylor University, and they say that that's when it kicks in after two weeks, this shot, supposedly. So I'm at a place where I'm definitely not going to get my booster because I had these adverse effects. I've had many doctors that have told me, don't get the booster. It wouldn't be smart for you to do that. And... I have a political party that I voted for throughout my whole life that I believe in their ideals for the most part mm -hmm. that I think has really been owned right now by Big Pharma and repeating Big Pharma talking points. And then another political party that I don't believe in, period, <laughs> that I think they're, a lot of the people are psychotic, but I believe 
a lot of the points that these people that are anti-vax are saying mm -hmm. that we should be debating about COVID-19. We should have doctors that are against the vaccine debating with doctors that are for the vaccine. But if you say something on the internet that's against the vaccine, you're immediately banned. <laughs> or the doctors that say something against the vaccine, they're uh, um, you know immediately called cuckoo clocks. So for a person that is an, I, I consider myself an intelligent person. You know, I, I follow politics in my whole life. I know what big pharma in the, you know, the tentacles that they have around these politicians, as you stated too. I don't know what to believe anymore. I don't think anybody knows what to believe anymore. <laughs> and I think it is the money versus mission um, thing. Uh, I have been dealing uh, with vaccine refusers my whole career. And what I end up saying is, yes, the pharmaceutical industry, they're liars, robbers, and thieves. The insurance people are liars, robins, robbers, and thieves. But you're still better off not getting whooping cough and tetanus. Mm -hmm. And But it becomes part of people's core belief. That's the problem now. It's not just people believe on, and in the Democratic Party. A couple of things about being a Democrat, which... Um, uh, Will Rogers, who was a great comedian in the Depression, um, it was asked if he belonged to an organized political uh, uh, organization, and he said, "No, I'm a Democrat." And <laughs> and I was raised, and I honestly believe, if I ever voted for a Republican, my right hand would fall off. <laughs> but that said, um, we. We have reached a point where I believe we've crossed the line and medical care is hurting more people than it's helping. People yeah. don't trust medical care for a reason. And they also have stopped uh, trusting science, which is things I grew up believing in. I believed we could conquer cancer. I believed, um, and but now you go back to the way things were when I grew up. Uh, polio, there were special hospitals for people with polio. I have friends who were crippled by polio. People yeah. were dying from polio. When they came up with a vaccine, uh, there was no informed consent. There was none of all this stuff is you all marched down into the gym and you didn't get out of that gym without a shot. And we get rid of polio. Um, but we're not operating that way anymore. The inventor of the polio vaccine was asked if he was going to patent it to make money. Mm -hmm. And he said, can you patent the sun? In other words, right. science and this stuff belongs to everybody. He said, no, I'm not going to pat patent it. The people who discovered insulin were at, was, um, sold the commercial rights to Eli Lilly for $4 because they didn't want price to be in the way of service, in other words, in, in saving lives. We're not like that anymore. And when so people say um, the vaccine is driven by money, I believe they are at least partially right. I still believe by the numbers, I, I, I by the numbers, your, um, you know, uh, COVID is more likely to hurt you than the vaccine, especially the first you know, the, the first versions of COVID. But mm -hmm. that being said, I understand why people don't trust. And I, it's, it's um, and, you know, and that's a hard thing to grow up uh, trusting doctors and science and now to be in a situation where my patients don't trust science and they don't trust uh, doctors and I don't blame them even a little bit. Are you disappointed that, you know, throughout this COVID crisis, that doctors have just been pushing the vaccine if, instead of trying to look for therapeutics? I'm disappointed that we didn't come up with better vaccines. I'm disappointed yeah. that the science, again, has gone into making what's essentially a blocked 
blockbuster drug. We can't afford any more blockbuster drugs. We can't afford to give this $4 trillion for healthcare that's worth about $1 trillion. If you take two to $3 trillion and you pump it back into the economy, uh, homelessness, autism, these things are gone. Yeah. And I think that if they did develop a better vaccine, it wouldn't, you wouldn't have to get three or four shots in one year. It would right. be one. You know, why, why is it that we get one flu shot a year? And I know the COVID is all new and people are going to say that when they hear this. Right. But why is it that we have one flu shot a year and for COVID, now they're going to have an Omicron specific? What's going to happen when Omicron is done and the next variant comes in? You the know, problem is the guys who come up with the Omicron variant uh, that works are suddenly going to be billionaires uh, or the people who are working for them. Um, and that is the overall problem that um, medical care is now profitable. The, the pediatricians who treated your asthma uh, were not getting $200 a visit. And they didn't need $200 a visit. I, I just want to say about childhood asthma is uh, you got better at least partly because uh, you're a man. Um, and one, I say one of the last advantages of being male in this country is asthma gets better. <laughs> when, you, when you go through puberty, the testosterone and everything, it treats asthma. So... So anyway, that's, you treated it with the exercise and everything. You did the right things. You know, as being a doctor, what other childhood illnesses are you seeing? I know there's a lot of pre-diabetes going around to do now. And I know we talked about the food and what's in it. What other illnesses are you seeing besides diabetes, autism for kids? The big thing I never expected to see going into pediatrics was um, anxiety and depression. Yeah. I think it yeah. almost, especially for whatever reason, um, teenage girls go to bed with the phone right next to them and they're waking up in the middle of the night saying, who likes who? We used to do the who likes who stuff, <laughs> but we didn't. We didn't keep each other up at night. Yeah. <laughs> so I and I and other pediatricians uh, are, you know, we're 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 prescribing um, antidepressants, anti-anxiety drugs, and you know, it's never number one on my list. It's like number five or six. But I say, okay, you can clean up your diet. You can turn up your note, your your um, <laughs> phone. <laughs> turn down less screen time uh walk or run two miles a day uh do more stuff outside with your friends mm -hmm. and we have some meds that help so you know i and i and if they say i don't want meds i say fine how about therapy they say no i hate therapy and i say ah that's fine with me here's the deal especially boys hate therapy. I hate to keep, you know, a trick I use uh, yeah. treating these, these guys who need therapy and they tell me they don't like it. I said, that's fine. Let me go see, get a therapist for you to explain why you don't like therapy. And at the end of that person taking time with a good therapist, they mm -hmm. say, ah, maybe I'll try this. So, yeah. but it's behavioral stuff along with the autism. It's anxiety and depression. And you're absolutely right. Suicide is, a, is these aren't just little um, problems. They do. They learn to, they lead to suicide. They lead to addiction. They lead to people stopping, um, you know, not caring about school, not caring about sports because the anxiety is so overwhelming. Right. But there, yeah. you know, there are a lot of things uh, you can do. The one, the one my wife likes, and my patients think are crazy. I, I ask all these things. You care about money? No, 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 no. I said, I'm out of <laughs> ideas. Why don't we get you a puppy? You know, and <laughs> and 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 they say, okay, you know, 
and I think to take care of something else. And then you start the argument with the parents about whether or not they can get a puppy. But to get a kid drawn in to that argument, uh, it, you know, it helps get rid of the anxiety and the depression. I truly believe that. Oh, no, no. I was just going to say, you go to these doctors, some of them, and they just get, you tell them the symptoms. And like you said, they don't talk to you for a long period of time. They just get that prescription pad out and start writing out the prescription and that's it. And it's yeah. right to pills. It's right to these anxiety or depression medications. And that's it. And right. they will see you in a month or two months or something like that. Right. And it's crazy. You know what I mean? But they, like you said, for most doctors, and I know you do it differently, for most doctors, they don't sit down and have a conversation. Doesn't have to be a 50 minute conversation. It could be for it could be like a 10, 20, 30 minute conversation as long as it's in depth and you ask the correct questions. Right. And as long as the doctor makes a connection with you. Because right. I don't and 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 caring. I mean, I, I don't think doctors care as much as they used to. No, no. Not at all. I, I agree with you 100%. It's about, like you said, it's mass production because of the student loans. And no one talks about that. The student loans, they talk about it. The only way that they say, oh, well, we don't want to help people with and get rid of the student loans because, it, you know, somebody that's rich, you know, might get away with something. That's life. <laughs> if we're on a Medicare for all system, people that are rich are going to be in the system too. You know what I mean? So what are we going to say? Okay, well, we're only going to put this these people in and then we're going to throw these people out. It, it's a joke. And then you'll just screw the care up because it's like taxes. Yeah. If you don't have people paying higher taxes and you have everybody low taxes, the services mm -hmm. will suck or there'll be no services. Yeah, most of that $4 trillion comes out of taxes. Yeah. So you, so people don't think it's real. My student debt was twenty thousand dollars, and I thought I I thought it was the end of the world. I, I swear, I said, I said, oh, uh, you know, I paid it back in a year, but but twenty thousand dollars to me uh, when I was what thirty four, whatever, yeah. it was the end of the world. Now kids are looking at a half million dollars. At least, yeah, at least a half million. It's terrible. Let's end the conversation with this, Doc. So what do you hope people get from the, reading this book? That medical care used to be better. It's better elsewhere. Uh, it doesn't have to be the way it is. I mean, we can do something, even just a simple thing like getting rid of co-payments. Right there, you have saved families hundreds of millions of dollars. Getting, you know, so I think there are very specific things that are hurting patients that we could get rid of. So I don't think people should accept medical care the way it is. I think they should know it can and could be different. And for doctors too. I've had a great time practicing medicine. And I think the burnout and all that is people doing what people tell them to do rather than what they know they should be doing for, you know, for their patients. So I think I'm an optimist and I think there are lots of ways we can make things better. Dr. Ivana Gott, again, the book is The Heart of Caring, A Life in Pediatrics. You can get it at your local bookstore, Barnes & Noble, or if you have to, I don't like to promote Amazon, but you can get it there too. Yeah, uh, Doc, it exists now. So, so uh, they, they, you know, it was delayed and delayed and delayed, uh, but it, the, the book... Uh, and it is Amazon. Most of when they, what it used to be the New York Times or whatever. Now it's what, what is your rank on Amazon? Right. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs>